Thank you very much, Julie, and thanks to the East-West Center and everyone for having us here. I was lucky enough to meet many of you at the reception last night and look forward to a great conference. As Julie said, I think I'm supposed to give the broad lens from an American perspective, so let me, that's a difficult thing to do in this time of our crazy presidential election, but let me start. Uh, the rise of Asia is a hopeful trend. It's something that all of us in the United States, Europe, here in the region should welcome and want to promote. Yet unfortunately, we find ourselves in the time here in 2016 where much of the world appears to be in a defensive crouch. You see it in Europe with the rise of right-wing parties, Brexit, people trying to leave uh, the European Union. Um, after decades of increased globalization, the trend towards ever more open borders, free flow of information and free flow of people, we seem to be retrenching. I talked about Europe. In the US, this trend is particularly intense right now during the time of our presidential election. So where it used to be a given that both major national parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, would be for ever gradually more open trade, that's not the case. You have in Donald Trump, someone who has tapped into the dissatisfaction of the group of people in America that's been left behind by globalization. Just to give you one example, a white, a Caucasian man in America who does not have a college education, on average lives 10 years less than someone who is well educated. So there is a group of people that really has been left behind, and Donald Trump is speaking directly to them when he is nativist, when he threatens to start a trade war with China, when he says completely outrageous things about how we should handle immigration as a country that has always welcomed immigrants. And frankly, you see it a little bit in Asia, in China, where the economy is slowing down, um, they have problems in their manufacturing sector in a way that's similar to how the U.S. is having problems in our manufacturing sector. And where sometimes you feel, as a U.S. observer of this, that as China retrenches, it wants to be more and more assertive on the international stage, which makes it difficult. We can overcome this trend. I'm confident that we can. But to do it, all of us, India, China, the US, all the countries represented in this room need nuanced, long-term, stable policies. <coughs> and speaking as an American with elections every four years, that's not very easy. And let me talk a little bit about what that would look like. Of course, we're always going to have national interests that diverge from each other. It is just a given. You manage those, in my view, by being very clear what the lines are and enforcing them quietly and consistently. So what do I mean by that? The South China Sea, of course, has been much in the news. Um, I would forgive some of our Asian colleagues if they were confused by America's stance on it. Uh, several years ago, we were running freedom of navigation operations all the time. Then we stopped for several years. Now we're back very much in the region. My view is that all the countries involved need to say very carefully to everyone who has um, land interests there, and that's everyone, China, Vietnam, the Philippines, others, land grabs are inappropriate. The law of the sea should be the way to do this, and we as a world community are going to enforce this. So that's just one example of where our national interests are going to diverge and we'll have to find a way to manage those problems without letting it become a crisis. But the most important thing that we can do, and the thing that I think we're all here to discuss, is how do we cooperate to get beyond this? And Charles very nicely opened the conference by talking about cooperation. It's a term that gets tossed around a lot, but it's actually incredibly difficult to do. Uh, and it's a muscle, like everything else, that needs to be practiced. And if you practice cooperation, you create the goodwill that makes the inevitable crises that we will all come up with easier to overcome. So let me give you an example. I was lucky enough to have a small part in the negotiations of the civilian nuclear deal between India and the United States. 
Before that happened, there was some cooperation between our two governments, but there was also, in many areas, a real feeling of mistrust. And when we were doing those negotiations, you know, we bear the scars. <laughs> Foreign Secretary Chayshek, who you'll hear from next, was a part of it with me. And it was not a foregone conclusion that we su would succeed. Uh, it was incredibly difficult, probably 15, 20 different rounds of negotiations, but we managed to do it together. And by doing that, we unlocked cooperation between the U.S. and India in all sorts of other fields, ranging from counterterrorism to clean energy to defense. It just has made, has, it has increased trust between the two. So now we need to find opportunities to do that. In particular, I would argue, with China, where I think it's fair to say to our Chinese friends here, um, we welcome China's rise. We want China to be a great power as part of it and take its place at the table of great powers. But frankly, we worry, especially in the United States. There's real worry and there's, an, um, there's a tendency to blame China that things aren't going well. So we need to find opportunities to overcome that. I think the climate change agreement uh, that was done in 2014 and now reiterated is a great start. And this is not just the role of governments. This is the role of journalists, all of us sitting here in this room. It's the role of corporations. Chinese corporations are making in India. Indian companies are helping us with their innovation and technology. American companies are helping China with clean, energy technologies and others, this is something that we all can do together. So having started with that, I will pass it on to Raja. Raja, first of all, yeah. Next, I, I would like to go to, to Raja Mohan and, and what he calls the inseparability of security policies of East and South Asia and the reconnection of these regions in expansive ways. Raja, you have our undivided attention in six minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thank you for those six minutes, and I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Let me extend a special welcome to Charles and the East-West Center here. Nice to see you in a big way uh, out in Delhi. Of course, we deal with uh, Adenauer Stiftung more often. They have a presence in Delhi, so it's a, it's a great idea. I think uh, the, uh, the conference here, and I'm delighted to be part of it. So, uh, many of you would have seen uh, the Prime Minister of India, uh, Mr. Modi, has just come back from an East Asia summit uh, in Vientiane in, uh, in uh, Laos last night. Uh, this is almost the 25th year uh, of India's Lucas policy, uh, and is also the 12th year of uh, India's you know, participation in the East Asia summit. But I remember quite distinctly when the East Asia summit as a forum was being formed in 2005, and in the run-up to it, uh, many of my yeah, Southeast Asian and East Asian friends said, what have you guys got to do with us? What is India doing in East Asia Summit? After all, India is part of South Asia. Uh, what have you got to do uh, to be participating in, in East Asia Summit? But at least some of our friends uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia thought uh, we were actually a part of the East Asia, uh, if not uh, geographically, at least politically. At least some of them saw the need to have India in the East Asia Summit. We'll get back into that for a minute. But the fact is, uh, that brings me to the first point. Uh, many of these terms that we use as separate compartments, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, many of these are recently constructed terms. No geography teacher in school tells us, look, these are fixed categories. These are separate regions. After all, the world is connected, uh, geography is, unites people. But the fact is, the political geography of these was relatively of relatively recent construction. The term Southeast Asia did not exist till Lord Mountbatten's, uh, you know, brought the Indian armies together in the Southeast Asia Command to push back the Japanese troops uh, out of Southeast Asia in the Second World War. Uh, if you go back to the Second World War period, I mean, all that there was was there was India, undivided India. Uh, there was China. Uh, there was for East Indies, or so they were called Further Indies, or so Indonesia as a term did not exist then. And that you had actually uh, these regions, uh, there was Indochina, there was Japan. So these, so no one had used the term either South Asia, there was no term called East Asia, and there was no term, as I said, till 1942, the term of uh, Southeast Asia. 
So these are the recently constructed terminologies, and it's easy to forget in our contemporary political discourse that these terms are of recent origin and that these would change depending upon economic and political orientation of the large units in these geographies. That brings me to the, to the second point, that it was the change of Indian economic orientation after independence that took India out of East Asia, as we may use in the current capitalization. Because if you go back to the 40s, I mean, for 150 years before that, uh, India was very much, undivided India was very much part of East Asia. In fact, uh, we are Chinese friends will remember us, uh, it was India that was doing the opium wars against our Chinese friends, the British India selling opium from India. And in fact, the opium wars and the trade between India and China saw the construction of a number of new cities. Hong Kong didn't exist till 150 years ago, the British India using Indian resources of builders. Singapore did not exist. Chennai did not exist. Calcutta did not exist. All these were constructions of a period when the British Raj of undivided India grew in its way and connected with, with the East Asian regions. So therefore, uh, but once India shut itself down after independence, so did China and the Monsatun, that the historic links, the natural economic links between these two regions disappeared. Because both of us were in this uh, big idea of Nehru and Mao of trying to create a third path, a separate third path, essentially meant, look, we do neither capitalism nor socialism, we want to do our own thing. Uh, our own thing means inward orientation, self-reliance, uh, cut yourself off of trade, of economic relations from the neighboring countries. It is a consequence of that, that India and China shut themselves down and the region was driven increasingly by Japan and Southeast Asia. But the Chinese economic reforms in the 19, from the late 1970s and India's economic reforms from the 1990s today have made them large economies, number two and number three in the world, uh, in, in PPP terms at least. And today, their outward orientation today is going to compel, whether we want it or not, much greater integration between the economies of India and China and between South Asia and East Asia. Of course, Pakistan is a bit of a laggard, but the rest of the region today uh, is increasingly looking to the East. Bangladesh today is a bridge between India and Southeast Asia. We see Myanmar as a bridge between India and Southeast Asia. We see the Chinese trying to build roads into India through Myanmar, the BCI and corridor. Uh, so when the Chinese talk about one belt, one road today, they're essentially talking about here is an expansive Chinese economy, Chinese capitalism that is trying to connect to the South Asian markets. And India too is looking out. When India talks about Actis, when India talks about new roads, both of them are essentially saying the same thing. China is doing it a lot better, of course, uh, which is that how do you build these connectivity projects? I see that you have a session on OBOR later. But the fact is the economic transformation of India and China is going to alter the geography of the region, and that's what we're beginning to see, that these neighboring regions today are going to be connected again. That brings me to the, the last question on, on, on politics, which is, many people think now politics, for example, today, a lot of people suspect uh, India, US, and Japan are ganging up against the Chinese, a lot of my Chinese friends uh, think so. Uh, of course, uh, we all say we have no such intention, but I just want to tell you how much political inversion has taken place. You go back to the Second World War, 70 years, who was ganging up against whom? British India, working with the Chinese, were ganging up against the Japanese. Right? The Japanese were in occupation of China, the Japanese were in occupation of uh, Burma, and that it was the Indian and the Chinese forces were getting together two national movements to push the Japanese out, uh, out, of, out of the Southeast Asia. And who was helping us do all this? Our dear American friends. Uh, if you remember Stilwell Road, if anybody is from the Northeast will know that the Stilwell Road was built from Eastern India into Southeast, Southwestern China to supply the Chinese nationalist government with the resources of the subcontinent. General Stilwell, American commander, built the BC. The, 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 what the Chinese are trying to do, the BCIM corridor was actually built under the British with the help of the Americans uh, into China. And one of the participants in the Great Indian War against the Japanese was one Mr. Obama, who was a Kenyan grandfather of the US president, who joined the British Indian Army as a cook to fight because the British were mobilizing everybody who could speak English or anybody who was around the British Empire. So therefore, the inversions are going to happen very quickly. But the fact is, we don't want to replay the ganging of one against the other. The challenge for us, I think, the theme of this conference, can India, China, and the US work together 
to construct a future in this region that works to reduce existing tensions, that finds a way of limiting our contradictions. Those are real. And let's not pretend there are no problems. There are serious problems. The question is, can India, China, and Japan, Japan and the US take the lead in limiting some of the conflicts that exist today and fi find ways in which we could work together uh, to produce a, a, a continent that is safe, not just on land, but also on water, because the waters of Asia are going to get even more important with the maritime dimension of global economic integration. Thank you. I think it's fitting that we turn to China uh, after that with um, Shi Songxing of the China Daily on the need for China and India to engage more to minimize the chances of miscalculation. Shi? Thank you, Julia. Thank you, colleagues, uh, Center, and uh, all the hosts of this great event. Uh, I'm going to spend you know, a few minutes on the China-India relationship. And uh, that China-India relationship actually goes back thousands of years ago. Because China and India uh, are two ancient civilizations of human beings. And the exchange did happen something like 30,000 years ago. And then now today, China and India actually are two emerging economies that are becoming the engines of the world economy. And China and India's status are rising very fast in the international community. But both China and India, actually, we are still very poor countries. Uh, in terms of, first of all, there are still large disparities in the company income, and there are still a high percentage of labor forces still engaged in agriculture, and there's still a high illiteracy rate. Uh, and of the two countries, there are something like 1.5 billion people still living uh, less than uh, two US dollars per day. And in terms of the political system, China is a socialist country, of course, but China started opening and reform something like over three decades ago. And China now adopts a market reform and free trade and encourages private economy. India, on the other hand, is the largest democracy in the world, but India started reforming its economic model since 1980s or 1990s. And India's, and India's now following the free trade and the capitalist models. And China and India have arrived at a consensus in many traditional and non-traditional fields and have common interests in seeking uh, the, in fighting against climate change to ensure food and energy security and both are making efforts to safeguard stability in the Asia-Pacific region and uh, try to build up a reasonable world economic order. And also between the two countries, there, are, there have been a very high frequency of high-level visits and meetings of senior government officials that have ensured the, that communication is open and smooth. And that have also enabled the bilateral relationship to be lifted to a new high level. And, of course, it has also provided possibilities for future progress. And to fully realize the potential between Asia's two great powers, of course, China and India, must, at a minimum, avoid conflicts that could arise from apprehension, this perception, misunderstanding, or miscalculation. Beijing and New Delhi need to address their threat perceptions through great communication, confidence building, and institutionalized conflict management mechanism. China's and India's growing economies 
and the mod modernizing militaries do not need to be seen as aimed at each other or in zero sum terms. And we also need to, greater, need to have greater engagement and dialogues on strategic intents that could go a long way in heading off suspicion and, uh, and hostility. Uh, I remember uh, three years ago when the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang visited India, he said that healthy and stable groups of China in their relationship is a blessing to Asia as well as the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shan. I'd like to turn now to uh, a topic of the, the, the regional partners and, uh, and to Yoshi Sohea of Keio University on the building of regional partnerships that steer clear of power politics, especially the U.S.-Chinese strategic rivalry. Ro Yoshi? Thank, thank you, uh, Julie. Uh, uh, I would like to echo previous speakers uh, in thanking this lesson, but particularly Charles Morrison, for bringing me to India. This is my second trip to India. I should have come more, uh, hopefully, more opportunities in years ahead. And uh, the Indian course as well. Well, uh, in six minutes, uh, Julie's introduction had to do with uh, what she asked us to give her uh, previously. Uh, but I had the impression that previous speakers did not necessarily follow what they have given. And I, I don't know if to what extent I can defray from uh, the theme. Uh, uh, but if time allows, yes, I'd like to come to that point. But before that, uh, I'm, I'm just a mere scholar. So I'd like to provide uh, my own perspective to what's, what's actually uh, happening in the region. And along the theme of this panel, uh, which is uh, political security relations between South and East Asia. Uh, I understand East Asia uh, having uh, being composed of Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. And uh, if, if my uh, understanding is correct, I think central theme of this panel is to to think of uh, ties among the three sort of sub regions. And if, if you look at South, South, South Asia and East, Northeast Asia, I think Southeast Asia is just in the middle. And maybe this will naturally uh, bring up a, what has already become a cliche uh, question as to how effective so-called ASEAN way is in bringing about regional multilateral cooperation. And maybe Kadi may, may have something to say about that, which I'm not sure about. But, but on that premise, uh, uh, as, as a kind of uh, uh, way to look at what's actually uh, happening and what are the potentials of cooperation among these three sub-regions, uh, I think, of course, uh, central critical uh, factor is, of course, the rise of China. And uh, for better or worse, uh, I think China connects uh, three of us. And uh, I, I, just, I just say this as a kind of objective sort of observation of uh, the condition. But what is, what is really difficult about thinking about uh, China as a central sort of uh, uh, driver of, of regional changes is, is that uh, regions or countries uh, in the vicinity of China uh, will have to continue to coexist with China forever, no matter what. We cannot move away. And, and of course, we cannot fight against China, which is a tragedy for all of us, which we need to avoid. And I think those things should be obvious for, for all of us. Uh, but secondly, we are witnessing a somewhat increasing inclination on the, on the part of China to resolve to its somewhat unilateralism as its power increases. So, so how to cope with and deal with uh, Chinese inclination towards unilateralism uh, under the sort of, I think, obvious uh, kind of prospect uh, in the future where you know, we have to create some sort of uh, mechanism to, to work with China 
and coexist with China eventually, uh, prosperously and peacefully. And uh, there is innate contradiction, I think, uh, in, in these two aspects uh, of uh, kind of realities. And uh, if I may just uh, wear a Japanese hat uh, for, for the moment, uh, I think we, we have a very mixed feelings about this contradiction because uh, Japan was on the forefront, uh, particularly since the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, in helping China to modernize and develop. And the official slogan of our government in starting to provide Commissioners ODA and the private uh, and direct investment uh, was economically stable, developed China is good for its social stability and the political stability, and that is eventually good for not only Sino-Japanese relations, but for East Asia and, and the world. Uh, I think uh, Japan was serious. In, in, that was not just a slogan. I think that was a uh, kind of well, kind of received, and accepted uh, basic uh, attitude of the Japanese, not only government but the society, including the business community, uh, in, in associating with China as it start, started its modernization uh, uh, program under uh, Deng Xiaoping. And, uh, but now we are facing with an increasingly kind of assertive uh, behaviors coming from China. And uh, I think our politics is somewhat at a loss in uh, dealing with this somewhat contradictory evolution of our relations with China over the last only uh, four, 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 five, five decades. And, uh, so in dealing with these contradictory aspects uh, of the rise of China, I think one important concept uh, which we have to grapple with is a, a so-called new model of major power relations uh, often initiated by Chinese leaders. And uh, one, I think it was Singaporean, sounds like Singaporean, a uh, diplomat mentioned somewhere, I read it in one of the blogs of journalists, uh, uh, said, uh, I don't think China wants to control the world. They just want to control us. And, uh, and so for this you know, new model of major power relations, I think is somewhat indicative of that uh, statement because what this concept aspires to achieve is, is to have some of the China-centered Asia, which would not contradict with American role in, in, in the world. And the one condition is, of course, the U.S. should not intervene into these Asian affairs. So if the U.S. is out, China would be ready to happily continue to coexist with the United States. And, uh, and if that's the case, uh, this is not the traditional unilateralism by just a great power in the Western sense. It's uniquely Chinese. And, and so how, how to, how to you know, uh, understand this Chinese tendency of unilateralism is, is, I think, very, very much important and key to all Asian nations to, to work with China. And uh, so, uh, so that's, that's my take on uh, the rise of China. And if that's the case, then what's, what are the sort of solutions? That's, that's, I, don't have any, I don't have any answer to this. We will continue to deal with this for, for a long time. And uh, if I may, maybe if I come to that point that Julie mentioned, I think there are two, two explicit aspects in, in this coping Excuse strategy. Excuse me, Yoshi, of just let me interrupt very briefly. If you could um, do it quickly. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll finish 30 seconds. Uh, there are two dimensions. One is dimension of power politics, where the role of the U.S. is important, and the U.S.-Japan alliance is important. But uh, another aspect is a sort of uh, kind of non-traditional typical typical cooperation. And this is where ASEAN, effective in a ASEAN way, is, 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 is to be discussed. And, uh, and there are, I think, several aspects uh, which I'm happy to, to discuss in Q&A questions. But, uh, and, but my last point is we have to be more explicitly focusing on non-power politics dimension of regional evolution. Otherwise, the kind of future long-term objective of coexisting with China will be gone. Sorry, Paul. Thank you, Yoshi. Uh, let's hear from Govi Jongkituan, who is also a senior fellow at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Bangkok, on who's really seen as a threat. 
Uh, I think Govi also has a call out to India uh, to step up leadership. So the floor is yours, Kavi. Well, thank you, Judy. Thank you uh, for the invitations. As you know, it's very good uh, to come back to India, as my name suggests. When I said my name is Govi, every India would check that Acha is being poet. So I'm very happy because nobody mispronounced uh, my name. And uh, that's also try to tell you that uh, you have four elephants in the room. I'm from Thailand, from Southeast Asia, small squirrel, trying to run around, avoid the stampede of the four elephants. Now, coming from Southeast Asia, we have to be, to be humble. You can see us as a bridge or as a barrel because we divide between China and India. But for us, aspiration come, come from both. But today, uh, I will touch on a little bit on, on India because India as a country, as a power, very lucky. Number one, in Southeast Asia, no country perceives India as enemy. That is the biggest asset for India. Number two, very sad, India has never taken up that opportunity. <laughs> India, uh, look at uh, the East for over 10 years, and then, you know, try to act, it take another three years. And I would describe, you know, jokingly, from look East to act East, now India is at ease with the East. <laughs> uh, you, you look at Calvary, it's very interesting at the local. South Asia, you know, very construct line above South Asia. You look at the East, very sweet stroke brush. You know, India as India moves slow. And appreciation with time, that is the problem. Because we're from Southeast Asia, we look to India, you know, on and on. It has never come. It will be holding. <laughs> Why? I will explain to you. Number one, because um, India and China has been competing for attention for Southeast Asia for a long time. Actually, it all started out. Since um, uh, we are part of ASEAN, India and China start at the same time by signing the Treaty of Immediate Cooperation in 2003. They start at the same time. But today, china asean relation has generated 44 committees governing the whole gamut of all relations in all dimensions. For India, it's only 19 committee. That show you how slow India moves. And in fact, India is the motherhood of Southeast Asia, culturally speaking. Economically speaking, people talk about rising India, Tatars, and what's not, uh, Bollywood, you know. Um, I, I, I was raised with uh, uh, Indian movie too, not only Kung Fu. But the point here is, uh, India has not yet taken up Southeast Asia seriously. But I'm very happy with Modi, because Modi now said that we have to act quickly. Even in the act of quickly, still cannot compete with China. China already, you know, have how many projects with ASEAN? Over 100 projects. When China says something to an ASEAN, next week or two, they come up with a working group. So India need to do that. India is great. Now India... <coughs> Uh, has already uh, tried to work on connectivity. Connectivity, as Moran said, is very important. India, for the first time, has to be connected uh, with Southeast Asia through trilateral highway. India said it should be finished by the end of this year. As many things in India, it's a little bit uh, prolonged, you know. It will take another one or two years. It has to be finished quickly, because that's the only way. Otherwise, one belt, one road will come to you. And China will have one belt, one road. India does not want to have one belt, one road, according to my Indian friends, because all the one belt, one road go through other countries, not directly between India and China. So you better finish the trilateral highway. That's the only way to connect by land between the great Indians and Southeast Asia. That's very, very, very important. <coughs> now, with rising China, China is the country that Southeast Asia has to deal with. We cannot run away. As Soya said, you know, we cannot run away. We have uh, to learn how to engage uh, the Chinese. Every time ASEAN has a meeting, International Wide Service media will just say that. ASEAN is a friend of China. ASEAN is a top shop. ASEAN will never mention anything that will upset China. You know, you can say whatever you like. 
But that is not true. ASEAN is not a friend of China. ASEAN is not, actually, I have to say it again, it's not a friend of China. We're just a little bit shy in front of China. So when we do things, you know, we save face. We save face. And for our own goods. Because our action, whatever we do, the consequence will be on us. Okay? Now, America has done what it has for six years. It has internationalized uh, successfully with South China Sea. Now, I think Obama has done very clear that we'll still need engage, but please uh, do whatever you uh, like with your uh, issue here. You already have the wording. Mention it or not, it's not your, our problems because the wording is there, the July 12. And I think Philippines has taken the right action in the sense that. Uh, Philippines said we will have direct talk with China, whatever it is, and that will produce a, a better outcome. Now, what to do? From Southeast Asia point of view, you have uh, China, US, now Japan has entered the game, the big game, because for years we have very good relations, ASEAN has very good relations for four decades uh, with Japan, all focus on developments, uh, the foreign Greece, uh, Japan has promoted ASEAN economics now. We are one of the uh, uh, leading economy as a group, 625 million. But politically, uh, we are small. We don't have uh, power. So we have to engage with all the major powers uh, in, in front of us. The way ASEAN uh, does this is this. Have you noticed that ASEAN as a group is not strong and it's not weak? Because if we are too strong, Major power will not want to get involved with you because they think that they cannot influence you. So ASEAN, every time, when external relations demand, they will act. There are a lot of times in the crisis, they respond. For example, Alvi and Fu, they come up, uh, uh, the meeting made immediately. Uh, when they have crisis on the haze, they come and meet together. And in South China Sea, from now on, you will see a much more united ASEAN. But don't expect ASEAN to come up with a strong statement as journalists would like to see, especially AFP, you know, would like to see ASEAN, you know, lash out at China, you will never hear that. But ASEAN will continue to maintain its centrality, which is very important, because we have to stick together, otherwise, uh, you know, each country. ASEAN is very strange, because it's very diverse, and we are not like EU. And I hate it whenever uh, why so we said that? This is journalist's job that have to be educated. They always say that ASEAN is moved toward EU. No, we are orange. EU is an apple. <laughs> the whole way. It's completely different. Oh, I will end here, but just to sh show you that ASEAN will stay, Southeast Asia will stay, whether we are a bridge between China and India or a barrier, it depends on how these two big power engage us. Thank you. Go, we don't turn your mic off quite yet. I, I want to get a little interaction with the, with the, um, with the folks up here. Um, and, and first of all, to, to pick up on what, what Gobi has said, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, and Raja jump in, and, and, and Anya I think has some opinions on this too. What, what are the implications, um, Gobi, for, for India's slow motion? Um, what, what does it really mean um, if, if India it doesn't board the boat quick enough? I address that to Govi, and then I'd like to hear that from I'd like to hear that from Raja as well. You, you want me to come in? Yes. I, I think India has to act faster because time does not wait for India anymore. India is a big power, and India has a good image. For example, in innovation. India has more engagement with Silicon Valley than the rest of Southeast Asia. How can you explain that? I will stop uh, eating chapati soon. <laughs> <laughs> How can you explain that? Because India lacked the kind of confidence. Now, I think India is more confident under Modi. I, I must give credit to Modi because Modi, you know, really promote India. But we yet to see action. Tairatara Highway is one of the most important. Secondly, made in India. You know, India is very popular in Southeast Asia, but yet there's no concrete policy 
initiative that really uh, set forth India as the force to be reckoned with. And that's the problem, there's no focus. And I don't know why. Now, that is the economy. On the security, uh, it's another issue. This is something new. And I think uh, Southeast Asia look at India as a balancer, as a fuselage. You know, you have airplanes, you have uh, China and India, and so uh, we try to keep our flights smooth along the way without any bumps. But India has not responded that much. And I think one way is that India, what I mentioned, India joined East Asia Summit. But what has India contributed to East Asia Summit? <coughs> India is a big power. It should come up with a good view how to uh, engage Southeast Asia, but not yet, not any time. You never hear India say anything much at all. And I have to give credit to India, because in 1992, Pakistan and India start out at the same time. Three years later, India become full dialogue partner and left everybody behind. In our concept, Southeast Asia is India. Very few that other country exist, except you come from Thailand. We know Nepal, we know the, uh, other country because of the Buddhist linkage. Other than that, South Asia is India. So India has to really act fast because this is the only way. Otherwise, uh, you know, one belt, one road, other countries will just uh, supersede India. Just, uh, it's, uh, I think uh, Kavi has just uh, pointed to the uh, essential problem with India's uh, policies in the region. They say it's not look east or act east, but act fast. And that's, that's, what, that's what they want. Uh, and I think the, the problem, I think, at three levels, I mean, I think we've seen over the last 25 years. Now, the, on the economic side, the, as it is India's reopening of the economic reforms that reconnected it to the region. But I think the reform process in India is so slow. And the opposition to free trade, for example, domestically, is so deep on the left and the right. Uh, that has significantly limited your capacity to reach out and engage Southeast Asia. And I think even now, uh, this government, for example, has done very well on the other fronts at least. But on trade, I mean, you see, there's still the question of uh, how does India uh, relate itself uh, to, the, uh, to the region. And I think you saw the GST bill has just been passed. India is trying to do a free trade treaty with itself right now. So once we, uh, the, ref the, the case for reform grows within India, uh, I think that is the variable that's going to limit its uh, thing to the uh, region. Second, I think connectivity again, I think uh, we've seen projects are delayed. The trilateral highway goes back to nearly two decades. It's not yet ready. My sense is this government is far more focused on implementation. And, and unlike in the, in the previous governments, that there was a lot of problems of executing projects. The Chinese will build a pipeline across Burma in two years flat between Yunnan and the Bay of Bengal, and India is still struggling to do things. So I think one of the things this government is trying to do uh, is to create institutional framework in which you can create uh, effective partnerships between Indian government and the private sector. Because unlike in the Chinese case, where the state companies fueled by cheap uh, money uh, and labor that supports it, can execute projects, but in India, I think there are problems, and I think the question is they need to find a framework for that. Lastly, on security, it is there is some good news. Uh, India's uh, self uh, limitation in the name of non alignment, and uh, we don't do big power politics and that kind of policies which limited the previous governments. But I think this government has broken out of it. Today, it's more open for strategic partnership with the Americans, it is doing more things with the Japanese. And we saw the last week the PM announced in Vietnam $500 million of military assistance to, to Vietnam. Uh, so I think the, the signs of change are there. The question is, it's not fast enough, as we can see. The demand is outpacing India's capacity to supply economic and security partnerships in the region. Let me react to two points that were made earlier. Uh, first, on the trampling elephants. It is a very vivid um, pictorial for us. As Americans, we never like to think of ourselves as elephants trampling on small peoples around the world. Nevertheless, that is often how we are perceived. What we struggle with is that when the big US elephant leaves, people call for us to come back. <laughs> so we're a little bit stuck. I mean, you've seen in the Obama administration a real pulling back from engagement in the world, especially in the Middle East, uh, other places. And uh, once we do that, 
you hear, you've left a security vacuum. Where are you? Why aren't you in Syria? Why aren't you doing this? When we pull back from the South China Sea, we hear, what's going on? You're letting China trample on our interests. So this is something we struggle with constantly, and we don't get the balance always correct. The other thing I wanted to react to was Julie's comment, which was offhand, which said, the US-China strategic rivalry. And unfortunately, this term is becoming more and more common in Washington, in Beijing, and around the world. And I just want to emphasize that this is not inevitable. This is something that we are all, we're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy, and I worry that we are sliding towards this without quite understanding the consequences. I can tell you clearly that no one in Washington or anywhere. Would you, would you dispute the idea that there is a rivalry? Uh, I think there's a rivalry that's beginning, but we have an opportunity to make it not that way. And here's how. And I think, you know, we're, we're now at the 11th hour, but there's still a chance to not create the inevitable rivalry. So what you hear a lot in DC circles right now is, well, every time a new great power arises, there's inevitable conflict, right? That's sort of the easy political science one. There's one example of where that didn't happen, and that is Great Britain managed the rise of the United States in a very impressive, nuanced way. Now it seems inevitable that you, the United States rose, when Great Britain was the great power in the 19th century, the United States was rising and rising, and eventually we became great allies now that seems inevitable. At the time, it was far from. In fact, we fought a war against Great Britain in 1776, then again in 1812. There were heated disagreements on all things from trade. Um, the United States, as a new power, acted impetuously and inappropriately in a lot of things in the 19th century. And Great Britain had a very patient relationship with us where they said, okay, you're trying to do this, what you're doing in Venezuela is not appropriate, we're gonna stop you, but we're going to do what we can to integrate you in the world and bring you on the governing body of the world. And I think it's not too late for the United States and China to have exactly that kind of relationship. But what it requires is for both of us to opt in, and frankly, the other elephants in the room to please stand up and also participate. So I'll bring it back to, Gavi and what Raja said, it is time for India and Thailand and Japan and others to all be engaged so that we don't create the inevitable rivalry. Thanks. We're, the clock is ticking down. I'd like to throw this out to the audience. Are there questions that you have particularly um, for any of our guests? And does anybody have any questions about the election in the United States and, <laughs> and how that is seen here? Or, or, or the sense that what, you know, what, would, a, what would a Clinton a presidency uh, look like uh, for how, how would that play into you know, how, how, how would Asia view it? What would a Trump presidency um, mean for for this part of the world? Uh, but first I want to I, I want to turn to the audience to see if there's any questions and we'll field those first. Okay. Let's move on to the presidential election. Who wants to take that first? The Americans first. Well, okay. I'm up again, and I'll keep it short. I'm laughing because otherwise I would cry. Uh, it, you know, we haven't seen an election like this in my memory, at least. It has been very difficult with uh, Trump winning the Republican nomination to have any cohesive conversation about policy. Um, Clinton has to be out there addressing all of his outrageous tweets and comments, and so she hasn't been able to lay out um, what I think would be a very moderate, uh, thoughtful, respectful foreign policy. I do think a Clinton foreign policy would be slightly tougher than what you've seen from Obama. She is more uh, willing to use American power and to be engaged in the world. So I think if she is elected, you will see uh, the elephant come back a little bit, but not in a, hopefully not in a trampling way. <laughs> um, if Trump is elected, and as you can hear from my tone of voice, I hope he is not, it is anybody's guess. This man 
um, knows nothing about the world and takes advice from no one. And that is incredibly dangerous as someone who could be the leader of one of the large countries in the world. So um, I hope for all of us here in the room that that is an outcome that doesn't happen. I must uh, begin by saying we don't have a vote in the U.S. elections. <laughs> so uh, I think the Americans have a right to be partisan because it's their country, it's their governments, their elections. But U.S. being U.S. and being the largest uh, political entity in the U.S. in the world, uh, it has an impact on everyone. So in a sense, we ought to be concerned about what's happening in the U.S. because what the U.S. does affects all of us. But I think we also have to maintain some distance, some dispassionate approach to what is unfolding in the U.S. Because I think the Washington elite, uh, the national media in the U.S. have had a complete blind spot. They couldn't see Trump rising. Even last week, they could not see the race was going to tighten. So I think there is a problem when Trump says the establishment, in fact, you know, he's a billionaire, but he says there is an establishment uh, which is globalist, which is free trade oriented, which is interventionist. I'm opposed to that. And I think, as Anya said earlier, it has found a lot of resonance. And I think we've got to factor that in, in, into our account. After all, what Trump is saying, the more realistic foreign policy, limited international engagement, is an argument that actually was initiated by Obama himself. And it was supported by people like Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party, Rand Paul in the Republican Party. So I think we've got to come to terms with the fact that there is an exhaustion, there is a strategic envy with the kind of expansive role that the US has played. So it's up to the US to decide how much role they're going to play. I and mean, I can't decide, because all I'm saying is, if there is a shift in that position, we got to be prepared for that. And that India and other countries must be prepared to take a larger responsibility for their own affairs. That is the important thing. I mean, how it happens in the US, that's their, their business. But if the US pulls back even a little bit, of, if there is a retrenchment in the US, we got to be prepared for it. It's not saying Trump is good or bad. That's not my, my concern. My concern is if the U.S. structurally moves towards a lesser role in the world, we got to be prepared because all these years we've had the luxury of criticizing the U.S. for what it does and uh, hoping that they will fix the problem. But today, I think you're going to have a problem that, look, if the U.S. really pulls back on the Middle East, as Obama said, don't do stupid shit, you know, which is maybe, I don't know, that will be the policy for the next five years. But if the U.S. does less in the Middle East, are we going to sit back and criticize the Americans for what they don't do in the Middle East? Or do we take a larger role? That is going to be the challenge for us and not the luxury of simply criticizing the Americans for whatever they do. The second question is going to be, if the U.S. really becomes protectionist, all these years we've said, Americans were telling us, look, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, change your IPR, change your this, change your that. We said, look, the Americans constantly pushing, you know. But the moment the Americans start cutting down h one b visas, I don't know, a lot of young people who still want computer types would want to go and work in the U.S. Visas, trade, immigration are three key issues that Trump has raised. The U.S. wants to shut down or limit its expansive economic engagement. Boy, we are in trouble. Because all these days, it's easy to criticize the Americans for protectionists when they were really not. When you really see America turn protectionist, we then have a huge problem in terms of how we're going to relate to ourselves in the region, how we relate to the world. So I would say this is a definitive moment in American political evolution post-war. And I think this is a structural change. It's possible. And I think the race is tightening. I would say Trump has a reasonable chance of winning. So we got to be prepared to take this seriously and not merely scoff at Trump, but prepare for a potential fundamental change in Washington, which could affect everything that we thought was unchangeable in the world.